The United Nations Human Rights Committee, the supreme body for United Nations human rights work, uh, subject to the Security Council, begins its 2019 sessions at the end of February, and they'll run into March. This is a very important time and a very important matter on the agenda for the people of Sri Lanka, and particularly the Tamil community, because the Council will consider what to do about the government of Sri Lanka's failure to implement its demands for accountability for the brutal massacres that took place almost 10 years ago. Now, let me first remind you of what did take place. In 2009, the government and the army of Sri Lanka took the opportunity to begin a massive attack by bombardment and invasion of the 400,000 strong Tamil community in the north of the island. The aim was to eradicate forever the independence fighting group the Tamil Tigers. In the course of that military operation, it's estimated that 40,000 civilians, maybe as many as 70,000, were killed, executed, and 350,000 were sent off as refugees, many of them injured. Now, by civilians, we mean women, children, old men, people who are not fighters and are not capable of fighting. So this is a very serious war crime and it has been for centuries under international law to kill civilians, to use them as targets, is an outrage which must be punished. Now, the government, of course, didn't want anyone to see what was happening with all these civilians being killed. It banned journalists from Sri Lanka. The only people it allowed in were from the Red Cross because they took an oath not to reveal what they saw. So that there was, uh, of course, at the time, uh, rumours that terrible killing was going on. But the government failed to keep it secret because phones with camera attachments were used by soldiers, by civilians, to get out the images of genocide, to get out the images of mass atrocity, a crime against humanity. Television stations in the West were able to reveal the lines of dead female bodies on the beach having been raped and strangled. They were able to reveal the crouching Tamil men about to be executed. These images although grainy and sometimes difficult to view, were exposed to the world. And the brutality of the forces under, under the president, uh, Raj Kapaska, was revealed to one and all. So this was really a a massacre, mass massacre, that couldn't be covered up. Its violence, its brutality, and its illegality were outstanding. The United Nations Human Rights Council then set up an inquiry to which the Rajkapaska government 
should have cooperated. It refused. It wouldn't have anything to do with the inquiry. It wouldn't even let the judges, including the chairman was uh, a former Indonesian attorney general, wouldn't let them into the country, afraid of what they might find. But uh, the committee of inquiry nonetheless did uh, interview a lot of escapees, a lot of people who'd been witness to the violence, and they formed a pretty good account, a pretty detailed account of exactly what happened. And their report was devastating. They had harsh words for the Tamil Tigers, for their tactic of holding hostages their own civilians, but uh, it was primarily an indictment of the government. The conduct of the war by the Sri Lankan army, the UN reported, quote, represented a grave assault on the entire regime of international law designed to protect individual dignity during both peace and war. It accused the government, army and navy of indiscriminate shelling of civilian areas and civilian camps, abducting members of the local media, starving civilians in the conflict zone of food and medical supplies, as well as torturing captured Tamil soldiers and raping civilian women. So it was a devastating report on the behaviour of the government and the military and naval officers and President Raj Kapaska. So what the Security Council should have done after this report came down was to send it to the International Criminal Court Prosecutor so that action could be taken. I should explain that the International Criminal Court is subject to references by the Security Council. Sri Lanka itself hasn't signed up to the court so the only way that its leaders can be prosecuted is by a reference from the Security Council. Well, unfortunately, the Security Council did not refer. It didn't take up the uh, UN's initial suggestion uh, because, of course, the Security Council is polaxed. It has five superpowers, Russia, China, America, Britain and France, and any one of those can veto an action. And China, which had some connections to Raj Kapaska and his government, indicated that it would veto any reference back in 2012 to the International Criminal Court. So that never happened. But the, nonetheless, there were some recommendations made by the Council that were meant to be binding on Sri Lanka. Set up a court, arrange accountability, attest and consider all the evidence of war crimes uh, committed by your generals. Well, none of that happened, but Mr. Raj Kapaska pretended to comply with the Security Council uh, demands by establishing what he called the Lessons Learnt and Reconciliation Commission. That was back in 2011. But that commission was a sham. People, witnesses were not protected if they gave evidence against the army commanders. It was not, it had no power to prosecute. It was toothless and gutless. It couldn't protect witnesses and for that reason 
human rights bodies uh, refused to cooperate with it. Its members were government lickspittles. They published a report in December 2011 which showed just where their loyalties lay. It criticised the Tigers. It didn't criticise the government. It whitewashed the behaviour of the Army and Navy. And while it couldn't overlook the evidence of the mass murder of civilians and the rape of some of the women, it nonetheless pretended that this was done by rogue elements and not pursuant to any government indication or to uh, support by senior of officers of the army and navy. So by the time Mr. Raj Kapaska, uh, albeit temporarily, perhaps departed the scene and a new government came in, uh, there had been no action to uh, take up the basic demands made by the United Nations for a measure of accountability. And in 2017, after nothing had been done, uh, the United States and Europe took the initiative in giving Sri Lanka two more years to bring in reform, to bring in accountab uh, accountability mechanisms. In particular, to bring in what is called a hybrid court. I better explain this because it's not an easily understandable concept. But a hybrid court is a court that is led by international judges and international prosecutors. But it has a minority of judges and prosecutors drawn from the local community. So that is why uh, it is called hybrid. But the main example of a hybrid court is the court of which I was the president in Sierra Leone. In that court, which was something of a success and put Charles Taylor and other um, perpetrators of crimes against humanity, uh, in jail for a very long time, uh, and did so fairly, was uh, set up by the United Nations. We had uh, four appeal judges were international, three were local. Uh, two of the trial judges were international, one was local. The prosecutor was independent international. The deputy prosecutor was local. So that there was a presence of people from the country, but the majority of judges and investigators were from the international community. And that was a fundamental demand of the United Nations uh, Human Rights Committee because it was clear that many local judges and lawyers were had deference, undue deference, to the government. And it was important, if accountability was to come, that it come through an independent element. And that was the demand made by the, secure, by the Human Rights Commission back in 2017. So there you have it. In 2017, two years ago, the Council said to Sri Lanka, you've got two years to set up an accountability mechanism to set up a hybrid court involving international justice figures. Well, what happened? The various politicians, including the president of Sri Lanka, refused point blank to allow independent foreign judges ever to pass judgment on their own people. People who had been fingered clearly by human rights reports as giving the orders for the killing 
of civilians. These people really should be in jail or should at least be facing prosecution. But as far as the government of Sri Lanka was concerned, they were sent off as ambassadors. They were elevated and given promotions. One of them, Major General de Silva, who was identified as the worst perpetrator by a lot of human rights groups, was hailed as a war hero and was made the army's chief of staff. Well, there couldn't be much worse snubbing nose at international human rights than to do that. But so many of those who've been identified as having command positions during the crime against humanity, against the Tamils, have now been promoted and are called war heroes by the government and the press. War heroes for killing innocent women and children. It's a pretty strange sort of war hero who does that. What the government did, instead of providing any accountability mechanism, was to pass laws that exempted, gave immunity to the armed forces from any court proceeding. There was a Missing Persons Act, but nothing very much has been done to implement that. So here we are, two years on from the 2017 resolution, with nothing, absolutely nothing, to show for it. What should the Council do now? Because it does risk falling into disrepute, becoming a laughing stock if it doesn't do something. The government of Sri Lanka has had plenty of time to get itself together to comply with, at least in part, with the Human Rights Council's recommendations. It hasn't, and it won't. What it will do is to ask for another two years extension another two years to do nothing. Well, that's a matter for the Security Council. If it gives two years extension, then it risks making itself a laughing stock. A council with a mandate to end human rights violations and to punish the worst perpetrators, simply giving them time to evade justice. Over time, of course, witnesses disappear, memories fade, court proceedings are less uh, practicable than they might have been in earlier years. So with that danger, it is important that if there are going to be court proceedings, that they start soon. So what should the Council do at its 2019 meetings. Obviously, it should give the government an ultimatum to set up a court, otherwise it should suffer um, sanctions. Its individual members should not be allowed to travel freely and its aid and other diplomatic ties should be cut. That can be done uh, quite simply and should be done. But in addition, the United Nations should, in my view, set up a special rapporteur, ideally based in Jaffna, who can report on the accountability, such as it is, of those responsible for the 2009 massacre. A rapporteur can keep the situation in Sri Lanka before the eyes of international bodies. He or she can report on what is necessary and what is practicable in a nation that is still fractured and which has not yet. And with a nation 
that is still fractured. So that is one development, but there are more important actions for the UNHRC to take. It could recommend to the Security Council that the situation be referred to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. That is what should have been done back in 2010, but wasn't. And it still can be done because the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over crimes against humanity committed since 2002. And this was certainly a crime against humanity. So that would be the best way forward so that the individuals who have been identified and against whom there is evidence of uh, perpetrating a mass atrocity should be capable of arrest and put on trial in The Hague. That would be the best step that the Human Rights Council could take. It can't take it of itself. It would need to be a recommendation to the Security Council. And the Security Council would have to have the support, as I explained, of Russia and of China. But if that were forthcoming, then something would actually happen. Might there be other solutions? Of course, the two-year extension should not be given uh, to Sri Lanka unless there was a strict time limit for establishing a court and other accountability mechanisms. They can't, it can't go on just giving Sri Lanka extra time and extra time. It must start to do something, otherwise it must face sanctions uh, imposed upon it for failing to do anything. If it declines to send the evidence to the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, it could, of course, as a Security Council, set up what are called an ad hoc tribunal, an ad hoc court called in to sit on cases from Sri Lanka alone, but with the power to punish, the power to jail those it found beyond reasonable doubt to be guilty of inciting crimes against humanity. That, that would be an alternate possibility. The Security Council could either send the case to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court or could set up a special court for the war in Sri Lanka. But one way or the other, something has to be done. So that is the situation that the Human Rights Council finds itself facing. It must, when it meets in a few weeks' time, it must, by the end of that meeting in March, decide, first of all, to reject Sri Lanka's demands for two years to do nothing. Uh, it must give an exact time frame for the establishment of accountability mechanisms like a local hybrid court. And secondly, it must either recommend the Security Council make a reference to the International Criminal Court or else set up a hybrid court. In both cases, with power to punish, with power to jail those perpetrators for a very long time. And thirdly, it should in any event appoint a special rapporteur, someone to keep the fate of the Tamils, to keep the anguish of the Tamil survivors before the world's eyes. A rapport, special rapporteur based uh, in Jaffna who can tell the world authoritatively what has happened, what isn't happening 
in relation to the Human Rights Council's demands. So there it is. It's time for the government of Sri Lanka to act or else suffer sanctions against its president and prime minister, its officials and its chiefs of army and navy staff. That is the stark position because the more delayed we are, the more mass graves are discovered, the more evidence is destroyed and disappeared the less likely it is that justice will be done if it's not done as soon as possible. So let us hope that the Human Rights Council does what is necessary to rehabilitate its own reputation and to advance the cause of human rights in the world by putting the government under strict instructions to set up accountability mechanisms within a short time and failing that to actually send the case to the International Criminal Court or to um, an ad hoc tribunal with power to punish the perpetrators. Failing that, of course, whether that there should be set up a UN rapporteur, special rapporteur, uh, as soon as possible from Japna. So it is important to maintain pressure, to maintain the rage, to see a measure of justice and accountability for all those victims. They cry out for assistance and let us hope that this time the Human Rights Council will not let them down.